welcome. You're about to listen to an encouraging, life-changing message presented at Joy Christian Center, Basildon. Amen and amen. Okay, my brothers and sisters, last week we started talking about um, change, game changers and wave makers. Game changers and wave makers. And um, the text we started with was Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 29, where the Bible says, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Do you see a man who excels? That's the New King James Version. In his work, he will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. This verse is telling us that the hard-working man, the, the person, the man or the woman who consistently uh, work and continue to develop themselves and continue to sharpen their skills will never remain in obscurity. Hallelujah. As we are diligent in our work and as we excel in what we do, the Bible says that you will not stand before ordinary men or obscure men. You will stand before kings. Praise the Lord. And as we talked last week, I define a game changer as a person who is a visionary or a game changer can also be an idea or it can also be a procedure that's a way of doing things a procedure that causes a major shift in current ways of doing or thinking about something so a game changer can be an individual somebody who has a vision who sees things that other people don't see a game changer can also be an idea, an idea that you have, amen, you know, a realization that you come to or a discovery that you made concerning something, that, like concerning a way things are done, and once you, you conceive that idea and, and you implement the idea, it, it actually creates a shift. It makes a change in the way things are done. Praise the Lord. That's a game changer. It is an event. It is the, the, the thing I call the aha moment. You know, that moment when you realize, aha, I've got it. That moment when you say, wow, this is it. And from time to time, in fact, every time we, we sometimes, whether we are aware or not, come into this aha moment. But unfortunately, most people miss they are game-changing moment or season simply because we are not prepared. Praise the Lord. We also talked about the six characteristics of a game-changer. And I want to give them to you quickly. The first one I said, a game-changer has skills. And I have mentioned that each, I read somewhere that each person has got about 500 skills more than we can use in a lifetime. And more often than not, you don't need all the 500, you only need one. Only one of your skills, one or two of them, can catapult you from obscurity into greatness. You don't need to exercise all the 500 skills you have. Some of them, we are not even aware we have those skills. They are latent, it's hidden within you. It's, it's a potential. Praise the Lord. A game changer is a problem solver because to move from obscurity into the limelight, you have to be somebody who solves problem. Amen. Amen. So a game changer is a problem solver. They solve problems, something that will help not just themselves but other people. And that is what will bring you out of obscurity. If the problem you are solving is just about you, you will remain in obscurity. Let me give you an example. Nobody knew of Mark Zuckerberg a few years ago. Nobody's heard of him before. But when he created Facebook and when he was working on this project, he was doing it alone with a couple of people. But when he created Facebook and this thing began to solve a problem, what problem did he solve? It solved the problem of how we relate, at least on the internet. 
Once that happened, it brought him out of obscurity. Then we started learning all kinds of things about his background. Nobody knew him then. That was when people knew that this young man um, had actually been accepted into Harvard University. It's a university that when you check on their waiting list, um, the earliest that people get onto that waiting list is three years. In other words, if, if you want to go to Harvard, you know, you have to apply when you are in secondary school, not sixth form, you have to apply when you're in secondary school like year seven or year eight. That's when you have to start applying for Harvard. And this man got, Mark Zuckerberg got the opportunity to go to Harvard. <laughs> and then first year, he gave up because of Facebook. Praise the Lord. He gave up his education, Harvard education, that people are dying for. He gave it up because of Facebook, because he saw the potential of what that could do. Now, this is not to say that you give up on your education, because sometimes you will need that education. Because now, if Zuckerberg wants to go to school and do all kinds of degrees, he can afford to pay. He can afford to pay the highest professors and stuff to come and teach him at home. Because he's got the money. He's, he's worth billions now because of Facebook. He solved the problem. A game changer is somebody who excels. It's a person who excels in whatever he does. In other, it, that also means that game changers are not, that's the third point, game changers are not mediocre people. They, don't, they, they are not satisfied with the status quo. Okay, so if a game, a game changer works nine to five, you will never catch him doing that till he gets on pension. He's only doing nine to, nine, that nine to five work for a, for a time because he's, he wants to go somewhere. And he knows that he needs to pay bills, he knows he needs to meet needs, so he's doing that for the time being, but his dream is somewhere else. So that is helping him get by, and sooner or later, he, shifts, he, he will shift from that place. So a game changer has an excellent spirit. They are always seeking to excel in life. They don't stay the same. Number four, a game changer, that is the fourth characteristic, for a game changer, has a teachable spirit. If you want to be a game changer, you must learn to be teachable. One of the qualities of a teachable person is that they are humble. They are humble enough to even learn from little children. Because sometimes your children, children can even teach you because they see things you don't. So a game changer is also a teachable person. They have a teachable spirit. Arrogant and proud people can never be game changers. Amen. Amen. A game changer is also an innovative person. That is, a game changer is a creative thinker. They are always thinking of how they can create things, make things. They like to experiment with things. And number six, I said a game changer has faith. If you're going to have skill, you want to be a problem solver, you want to excel in life, you, want, you have a teachable spirit, and you are innovative, you can't do without faith. You need faith. Faith in the sense that this faith will manifest in the form of confidence. Confidence in God and confidence in themselves. And because of that confidence, they never quit. When they fail, they will call it by another name. This was an experiment. It didn't work. I'll try another way. They don't use failure as final. For them, failure is not final. Failure is just a way of learning. And so they will try and try and try and try again until they succeed. A couple of days ago, Ghana had elections, and uh, the man who won the election, this was his third time. They beat him the first time. They beat him the second time. He, apparently, he has leased or sold his uh, family property in this country and has leased some family land in Ghana and put it in the election. They beat him. And now he tried it again. And this time he won by a small margin, but still he has won. You know, when, when, we, were, when we were little in, in primary school and nursery, you know, they taught us this rhyme, if at first you don't succeed, try again. 
some of us have come to this point where we have this um, motto, if at first you didn't succeed, give up. If at first you don't succeed, try again. Because the first way you didn't succeed just mean, means that you, you, you're not ready. You're not perfected yet. You, you haven't qualified yet. So, so keep pushing. Hallelujah. Amen. Keep pushing. So that's the six characteristics of um, a game changer. My prayer is that we, we will see some game changers in this church. I also said that wave makers or a wave maker is a faithful supporter, an encourager, a pacemaker, someone whose actions or performance challenges you to do better. Every game changer must have a wave maker in their lives. Have people who encourage you. Connect with people whose actions or performance or the way they do things motivate and encourage you. People who aspire you to achieve. Amen. In life. Have some of them among your friends. You should have friends who encourage you and you should have friends who come and eat your chicken. They don't encourage you. They take from you. It's fine. Don't have too many of them. They make you broke. That's just an advice. I'm just recapping. Okay? But have those who motivate and encourage you. Those who always look at you and say, ah, no, 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 you know, because of where you are going, you, you can't think like that. When you are thinking negative, they, they will tell you to snap out of it. You can't be thinking like that. No, 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 because of, look, my friend, you have a great future. Don't be thinking like this. Now, ignore that person. They are talking about you. Ignore them. You are going somewhere. That's why they are talking about you. In fact, it's because of what you are doing that they are noticing. That is why they are talking about you. So don't worry. I have a friend like that, and I love him. I love him to bits. Trust me, I'll never introduce you to him. <laughs> I'm very selfish about this guy. Praise the Lord. I won't. Because I know if you go there, you go and spoil it. So I won't. But as a friend like that, anytime I pick up the phone and I talk to him, I mean, he makes me feel like I'm 10 times taller than I am. This is not somebody who is, uh, he doesn't switch talk me. He knows. He knows, and I know he's not lying to me. And he always encourages me. We all need people like that. That's a wave maker. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's a wave maker. I mean, the other time I went to him, and we were talking about a friend who is going through difficulty in his marriage. And we talk about maybe 10 minutes, you know, as to how to help this friend. And then he said, okay, uh, pastor, you know what? Look, this is our friend. But, you, you know, let's, let's, I think you should come next time we sit down. We talk about how we can make millions. You see, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. You see, yeah, we have to make millions and billions. Pastor, we need to, hey, because when we get to heaven, God is going to ask you, what did you do with the talent and the time I gave you? He said, yeah, it's true. Amen. Amen. We could have sat there and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about our friend who is going through difficulty. He won't achieve anything. So he quickly put that aside and said, yeah, that's him. You know, we love him. We help him. But pastor, let, let's talk. Let's talk business. How to make money. How we can become millionaires and billionaires. And I like people like that. Even if I don't become a billionaire, the fact that he helped me think it, I'm happy. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So we need wave makers in our lives. People who will make wave. People who will encourage you. Lift you. We all need them. Now, for the next few weeks from today, even through Christmas, we are going to be learning how to become game changers from some of the people I consider to be game changers and wave makers in the Bible. First, I want us to look at David. I believe David was a game changer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. David was a game changer. So let's start with David. David the king of Israel. David had a game-changer moment when he first heard Goliath defying the army of Israel and cursing the God of Israel. Praise the Lord. But David, my brothers and sisters, was not an overnight success. Do you realize that? Most of us remember David defeating Goliath. 
But David started, defeating Goliath was just one moment in David's life as a young man. Around the age of 17, 18, probably 17. And, and just that event changed David's life. But before David defeated Goliath, like you and me, David never had it easy in life. Before we read from the Bible, let me give you some of these things because it's a long passage and I don't want us to spend too much time because I know I don't have too much time today. Like you and me, David did not have it easy when he was growing up in his father's house. First Samuel chapter 16 and chapter 17 captures the story beautifully. But I want to just hit on a few points in these two chapters as we move on. Read it when you get home. Can you do that? Do you promise you will? Yes. Amen. It's on record. If you don't read it, that's your own problem. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, you will read there that David was the last of eight children that Jesse had. So I like the family of Jesse because I also come from a family of eight children and I am the last born. That's why I like David. David is my bro. He's my pal. I like him because he was the last of his family. Three of David's brothers, his, three of his oldest brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, were among Saul's army. But David was left to tend the father's sheep. Just think about it. You are in a family of eight people. The last one you are. Now, your first three brothers, Eliab, Aminadab, and Shammah, have been enlisted in the army of the king. And you, they said to you, my friend, look after the sheep. While your brothers are fighting wars for the nation, you are David, so you are looking after the sheep. Every day you hear, meh. And from time to time, your father calls you, hey, David! I've got some cheese and uh, raisins and some provisions for your brothers on the battlefield. Take this food and go and give to your brother. Then the Bible says that David will leave the sheep in the hands of a keeper. And then he will go to the field and give the provisions to his brothers. And then he will come home and bring news to his father. Father, I saw brother Eliab. I saw Aminadab. I saw Shama. They are doing very well. They are not dead. They are fine. That was what David was doing while he was shepherding his father's flock. I pray the Lord open your eyes and your ears and your heart to receive this revelation. Amen. I'll unpack it in a minute. <laughs> Though he was the youngest, of, uh, the youngest son of Jesse, his own family, apart from looking after the sheep, his own family did not remember him when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel. They didn't remember him. All of them came. In fact, Eliab came. The Lord said to Samuel, it's not him. Aminadab, Shammah, all of them came. The Lord said it was until the seventh person came, seventh son came. And the Lord said it's not him. So the prophet then asked Jesse, is that all your children? Do you have another son? And, 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 and Jesse said, oh, yeah. We, we, we have the longest. He, he's with the sheep. Then someone said, go and bring him. For I will not sit down till he comes. Hmm. And then when David showed up, I like the way the Bible described him. It said he was bright-eyed. Handsome or ruddy. He was fair, bright-eyed, and handsome. And then the spirit of the Lord said to Samuel, that's him. That's him. So Samuel anointed him. So this is somebody who has been relegated to look after sheep while his brothers were enlisted in the army. This is somebody whose family forgot about him when they were anointing kings. They didn't even consider him. But God said, that's him. Hallelujah. David also had skills. David, while he was looking after the sheep, 
used some of the time to engage his mind in worshiping the God of heaven and doing all he can to learn whatever he could learn in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. Because David was not old enough to be in the army, so he had to rely on God and himself to be able to defend the sheep because around that place they, they encounter lions and bears and so on and so forth. So David learned how to sling a stone to protect the sheep. Praise the Lord. While he was composing psalms, <laughs> while he was worshiping God, while people were despising him, while you know, people were forgetting him, his own family were forgetting all about him, David was developing his skills in the wilderness, in obscurity. Nobody was there to say, come on, David, you can do it. Come on, David, you can make it. By the way, sometimes wave makers don't show up early in your life. So, so, so David was learning in the backsides of the wilderness, looking after sheep. But he had learned how to sling a stone. Now, where did he learn this from? To, to show you, please go to um, Judges. Judges, please. When David's family did not know, what they did not know was that as a shepherd boy, he had learned and perfected the art of slinging stones to such a level that lions and bears were no match for him at all. Now, Judges 20, I want to read from verse 14 to 16 only. It says, listen to this, it says, Then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these, so there were 26,000, there were also 700 chosen men. Now, among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth, or everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Did you see that? Now, here is what he's saying. That in the army of Israel, they had a left-hand regiment. The only thing that would qualify you to join that particular regiment is that you have to be left-handed. And this left-handed people, it was a special regiment. This left-handed people could sling a stone at a hair. It didn't say hair. It said a hair. One. In other words, if you pull out one hair like this and you hold it, they can put a stone in a sling and hit the hair with a stone and not touch your finger. That's how good they were in the army. And so this regiment... Or maybe this act of throwing stones by the left hand soldiers was something that was already in Israel. And somehow David also learnt it how to sling a stone. We have no record in scripture that David was left handed. So I would assume that David was right handed. So here is a young boy who has learned to do with his right hand what somebody else could do with their left hand. And he has perfected himself to that level probably a little more than the army guys. And here is the issue. One day, the Philistines gathered against Israel. And, and I like the Bible because the Bible is an honest book. 
The Bible said that in those days, the fire is not that today where they send drones and, you know, missiles and so on and so forth, and the soldiers stay in a, in a corner there behind the computer. No, no. In, in those days, you go face to face. It, it, bravery. You know, the, the Israelites will line up on one side, and their enemy will be on the other side, they are looking at each other. And then they'll start with swords and spear. So David had not been in the army, so this guy, you know, had not learned to use the sword well, but he's perfected the art of slinging a stone to such a degree that he could protect his father's sheep from lions and bears. That was his testimony. I don't think his family was aware of that. It was between David, the sheep, and God. Nobody knew. If only sheep could talk. I know. Some of you, that's your st testimony. If only sheep could talk, they would tell these people that I am a champion. No, no, the sheep can't talk. So the Bible said when the Philistines gathered against Israel, the problem for Israel is that the Philistines, unfortunately for the Israelites, the Philistines had a game changer. The Bible calls him a champion. I like God's The Bible is not biased, you know. The Bible call, calls Goliath a champion. He was nine foot six inches tall. And according to Saul, Goliath had been a warrior from his youth. This guy did nothing but to fight war. That's why he was called a champion. He's conquered a few people. So this guy, Goliath, knows what to do with spears. And that day when the Philistines gathered against Israel, Goliath showed up as the game changer of the Philistine and he changed the game. He said to them, hey Israel, we are not going to fight like we used to. Let me make it simple for you. That's one thing about game changers. They like to make things simple. We all don't have to fight. Just pick up one man to come and fight me. If he defeats me, my country will serve you. If I defeat the person, your person, you will serve us. Isn't that simple? It is simple, but the problem is that Goliath had sized up the Israelites, and he knew that the only person who was head and shoulders taller, taller than everybody in Israel was Saul. And Saul was afraid. The man was peeing himself. <laughs> and so Israel had already been defeated psychologically. And, and, and you see, there is something about you being faithful in little things. Because one morning, Jesse said to David, as usual, Hey, David, here is some food for your brothers. And by the way, take this cheese. And when you go this time, give it to the commander of the army. You know, so he will look after my children. So David carried this provision to his brothers. And for some strange reason, that day, Goliath came out again. Israel, chickens, I'm still waiting. Call on your God and come forward. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Then the Bible said David heard. See, that was the aha moment for David. That was the game changer moment when he heard Goliath. Something in him rose up. Then the Bible said he went to the army guys and said, uh, what would happen to the man who kills this, this thing? And, and they told him, they said, the, the king will promote him. His family will be exempted from taxes. They will be free. The king will also give his daughter to him to marry. And David went to, they, they, David went to another place. And he asked. And, and, and he asked them. And they were telling him. While they were telling David the story, that the reward that the killer of Goliath will get, Eliab came and he said, you again, you arrogant, treacherous boy, you came to spy the battle, didn't you? Who have you left those few sheep with? Go back. And David, the Bible says, looked at his elder brother and said, what have I done now? That statement suggests to me that they always treated David with scorn. He didn't say, what have I done? He said, what have I done now? 
And then David said, is there not a cause? Ah, yeah, yeah. Something was swelling inside this young boy who was not even in the army. Then the Bible said by this time the king Saul had heard what David was saying. So he said, come young man. David went to him. And he said, he said um, my lord, your servant can fight this man. Remember, the destiny of Israel lies in whoever fights Goliath. Because if they are defeated, the whole Israel will serve the Philistines. David is only around about 17. Saul talked with him, and, and, and then David brought out his te testimony. You must know when to testify and when not to testify. There are certain things about you you don't share until you have come to your aha moment. It's not everybody you have to give your CV. You must know when to hold on to it. And then when the right moment comes, then you release it. David's brother have never seen his CV. But the moment he got to Saul and he started talking to Saul, he brought out his CV. He said, King, you tell me this man is a champion and he has been a warrior from his youth. Let me tell you. I can take this guy down because number one, he is an uncircumcised Philistine and he has defied the armies of the living God. And he said, by the way, when your servant was looking after his father's sheep, a lion came and took a cub. He said, I struck the lion and killed it. He said, in fact, I struck the lion and delivered the sheep. And when the lion turned against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it. Now, hold on, hold on. If you have ever seen a picture of a lion, okay, a lion has a beard, actually, there, right under their chin. A male lion, that is. If you catch a lion by the beard, my brother, you are committed. It's either the lion dies or you die. And David said, I caught the lion by the beard and struck it and killed it. Then a bear also came and I did the same thing. Then he said, your servant can take out this guy. He will be like one of those, like the lion and the bear. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't get excited. Don't get excited yet. So the Bible then said, Saul said, okay, go and the Lord be with you. So by the way, here is my armor. Take it. So he put a helmet of bronze on David, gave him a coat of mail and everything. And his Saul's own sword he gave to David. He said, go and fight him. And the Bible said when David took a couple of steps, he stopped, took everything off, and he said to Saul, I cannot go with this, for I have not tested them. Game changers don't fight their battle with untested ammo. In other words, game changers will not operate with something they are not used to. If they have not tried and tested it, they won't use it. They are comfortable in their own skin. They will only go with what they know works for them. Who am I talking to here? See, if you are a game changer, for me, preaching and teaching works for me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If I try to become a prophet, I'll, I'll, I'll fail. For me, reading works for me. I'm, I, I like to read. Some people are not readers. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some, some people are very good at playing football. Now, if you are good at running and you are trying to impress people with playing football, you will make a fool of yourself. So David took off the armor and he said, I can't go with this for I have not tested it. When Goliath saw David, he started laughing. He said, you come to me with a, 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 a staff and a sling. Do you think I'm a dog? And David said, I think you are more than a dog. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me help you here. You see, David killing Goliath 
changed the life of his entire family. But before he got there, David had to endure ridicule. The family despised him, forgot all about him. He endured it, faithfully served his father while he was working and developing his skills in obscurity in the wilderness. You see, success comes when preparation collides with opportunity. And that was what happened to David. He has been preparing when nobody was looking. What are you doing now? You want to be a game changer? What do you do with your time now? What am I doing with my time now? Most of us, the moment we get a little time on our own, I'm so tired, ah, I work so hard, let me sleep, I deserve it. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding, on, or, or, or folding of the hands, the Bible says then poverty will come upon you like an armed man. People sleep. But you see, game changers will sleep when they need to. Oh, some of us sleep when we need to. But the fact is that we have decided, some of you have come to a place where you've decided that you need to sleep 10 hours in a day. I need my 10 hours sleep. So you have to sleep. I mean, you sleep. No matter what is happening, you must have your 10 hours. And you don't realize that vital time. You need your sleep. You don't realize that important time. It's being wasted while you're sleeping, doing nothing. But some people too know that they are going somewhere and because of that, they choose to sleep maybe between six, seven hours. They don't even sleep for eight hours. They deny themselves of some sleep and invest that in doing other things that would develop them to become game changers. And that is why these people will succeed. You see, when Zuckerberg knew that Facebook had the potential, he looked around and said, look, if I'm going to sit in class and do lectures and stuff like I can't do this. So forget about Harvard University. It's like somebody who, who's been accepted to Oxford first year and they said, I won't go again because I'm doing something on the computer. Hey, thank God he's a white guy, not an African. <laughs> like, like his spirit will kill him with their bare hands. Do you know how much it costs to get admission to Harvard? But he gave it up. Now I'm sure the parents are very comfortable. He can buy them private jets, each one. One, you know, one for father, one for mother, and give them change. That's how loaded the guy is. You see, that's an uncommon guy who made an uncommon decision. And game changers are like that. And that's David we are talking about. A lot of you. You, 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 you relate with friends, you walk in places where they talk to you about the left-handed people who are slinging stones. You have seen it. But you are saying to yourself, it's for left hand people, I can't do it, I'm right-handed. No, David learned to sling a stone with his right hand. The left hand people were doing it. When he saw it, he learned it. And he perfected it. Unfortunately, when Goliath showed up, the left hand regiment, I don't know where they were. They didn't realize that this thing we have been doing can kill this guy. But because David had engaged God in worship and loves his God, the man went there very confident and God gave him the revelation. Then the Bible said that when he was going to face Goliath, he only chose five stones. Five. In other words, David is saying that if I miss four, definitely, one must get him. That's how confident he was. He, he didn't go with a truckload of stones. No, no, no. He was so certain, so sure of himself that he chose five stones. One preacher said, because Goliath had four brothers. So he chose five stones. With me. If, if it's true, then David is saying that I'm so confident in my skill and my ability that the first stone I take will be for Goliath. The rest is for his four brothers. I will knock all of them down today. One stone each. That's how good and confident he was. Amen. But we are told that it was the first stone that killed Goliath. The first stone that killed him. 
whatever you are doing in obscurity, look, find out which one is your best skill and focus on it and develop it to such a level that the day you get the opportunity, you will not miss it. You know, you will take it like a hand in glove. Once, bam, you are done. Not two attempts. Once you've done it. Am I speaking to somebody? That's the attitude of a game changer. You don't give up. Eliab could have talked David out of that breakthrough. You arrogant boy. Who have you left the ship with? That's your senior brother talking. But David said, what have I done now? You have to learn how to answer people who despise you. And don't let people discourage you. Some of you, are, you want to study. Some of you want to develop your career. And maybe a friend, an auntie, an uncle, or even your own spouse. You, you think you can achieve this? And the moment they say that, it's like somebody has put a, a pin through a balloon. You, you, you are deflated. You, hmm, that's it. And that's your dream. No, 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 no. Game changers don't take no for an answer. Remember I told you last week, if a game changer fails, they'll call it by another name. I'm only trying. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm only trying. Some people fail that one driving test, and now you're angry with the world. You know, these uh, drivers, you, you are, they, are, they are racist. And, no, no, they are not racist. You failed. It's you. The driver is not racist at all. He didn't discriminate against you. He's just doing his job. It was you who failed. Go and perfect your skill and go back again. I remember when I was in uni and, 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 and I, I was writing my dissertation and stuff like that. One lecturer, you know, when he marked it, he said, poor grammar. I said, thank you. I could have said, ah, these people. And the man who said that to me was from South Africa. I said, aha, you see, this apartheid thing is in his mind. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know what I did? Because when I went back to uni, I said to myself that I've not been to school for a long time. So I'm not going to use the internet or anything like that. I'm just going to write the essay, my first essay. I'm going to write it raw. So I did. Because I want to assess myself. So I did, and I sent it. And lo and behold, I got what I wanted. <laughs> said poor grammar, insufficient references, da, da, da. No, aha, OK, is that it? Here we go. So now I know my limitations and my weakness. Then I started referencing. I became so proficient at it that when I finished my dissertation, my goodness, I was there, finished second class. Praise the Lord. If I had listened to poor grammar, I wouldn't get that second class. You know, some of you are a little criticism, then you want to set the world on fire. No, no, no. When people criticize you, they are just telling you that there is something in your life you need to work on. Work on it. Sometimes it hurts, but take it and work on it. If David had only listened to his brothers or had been angry and said, you called everybody before me, yes, you are the last one. Why should they call you first? So he showed up, and when he showed up, he got Goliath down. Listen, all of us, I said, we've each got about 500 skills and talents we can use, more than we can use in our lifetime. Which one have you developed to such a level that can get you into greater things? Because people who want to you know, aspire to greatness in life, they make uncommon decisions and uncommon choices. They determine... That listen, yeah, I will go to a party, but I won't stay there forever. Yeah, I will do this, but I'm not going to waste my time. Quickly, let me tell you three, three attributes of game changers. Number one, it's important. Number one, game changers are purpose driven. They have a purpose in life, and everything is about that purpose. It doesn't matter whether it is small or not. I heard recently watching a um, one of these African channels, and they were talking about an artist, a Nigerian artist, who, before he became great as an artist, you know what he did? He was collecting rubbish to go and sell. Rubbish. 
He was recycling things, bottles and stuff. He was taking bottles and plastics and so on and so forth to go and recycle them so he would get some money. Why was he doing that? He was doing that because he had written a song, but he didn't have the money to record the song. So he started collecting bottles and, and rubbish and stuff like that, and he was selling them. And this guy knew that sometimes when you have a dream, it's like you have a child. And some of us, we abort our baby because we are hungry. Not angry, but hungry. So we abort our baby. We eat anything. The guy who developed Coca-Cola aborted a multi-billion dollar dream because he was hungry. Somebody offered him. He was selling the Coca-Cola just in a stand by the wayside. Selling it, just like ordinary drink. And people were buying it. And somebody came and offered him $100. And in those days, $100 was a lot of money. So he took it and he sold the rights to that person. Today, there is no village in the world that Coca-Cola is not there. Somebody aborted that global dream because they were hungry. But game changers are purpose driven. They are always focused. They have a purpose in life. And they do everything to accomplish that purpose. Number two, game changers are relentless in their pursuit. That means they don't give up easily. It will take a lot for you to make a game changer give up. Their family will not put them down. Although they are going through hard times, don't let your family put you down. Be relentless in your pursuit. If you have a dream and you know it is worthwhile, don't give up. Pursue it. Let everybody talk against you. My friend, learn to be alone and pursue it. Pursue it. One day, your dream will manifest. Be relentless. Don't give up. You may fail. Fine. It's just a way of learning how it will work. Try again. Try again. Try again. Try again. And success will come. Amen. Number three. Game changers are original. David said to Saul, I can't go with this for I have not tested them. He was being original. Because he was a game changer. Somebody else will look at that and say, hey, praise the Lord. Even look at me. Even before I killed Goliath, the king has promoted me. He's giving me his clothes. No, no, no. David wore it and he said, sir, I can't take this for I have not tested them. So he took it down. He's not comfortable with that. He went with his sling, his shepherd's bag. That is war because that was what I used to kill the bear and the lion. And this same thing will get Goliath down. Some of you, you have been stopped. Halfway through accomplishing your dream because you are wearing Saul's armor. You've taken on somebody else's issue, clothing. And now you can't walk in them. But you're feeling too proud to take them down. Because maybe people will laugh at you. No, 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 no. Go with your tattered clothes. And when you get Goliath down, you will get more than Saul's armor. In fact, you will get his daughter. As a price. Am I preaching to somebody? <laughs> Game changers are original. You see, don't just play the game. <laughs> Change the game. Don't just leave. Make a difference. Make a mark in the sense of time. You must be a person as a game teacher who say, I can't, look, look, I'm not comfortable with this. I can't do it this way. Let me do it my way. I, I, I'm not right-handed, I'm left-handed, so let me do it like a left-handed person. I, I, I'm not left-handed, I'm right-handed, so let me do it like a right-handed person. And do it. What makes you comfortable? What you are comfortable with? You use it. We will pray in a minute. Hallelujah. Is somebody going to pray for me?